Okay, with fractures, we're going to talk about um, other types of fractures, but first we're going to talk about the patho of a fracture. Whenever a patient um, has a traumatic injury to a bone in which the continuity of the tissue um, is broken, there is going to be uh, insult to that bone. It could be from a forceful blow. Uh, some fractures can occur without trauma, and remember we said those are called pathological or spontaneous fractures because those are caused by a disease process which weakened the bone and led to the fracture. And some, remember uh, we said some of the causes of pathological or spontaneous fractures are things like cancer, osteoporosis, uh, tumors of the bone, uh, people who take long-term um, steroids, so they are more apt to have a pathological or spontaneous fracture. Fractures can result uh, from a direct force they can result from torsion, which means twisting, and also a fracture can occur from violent contractions. And we're going to talk about the description of fractures. Now, some of these uh, may be out of order from what is on the PowerPoint, or it might be out of order with what's in the book because the addition changed. So just follow along and find it as I talk about them. So first off, we're going to talk about um, an open. Whenever we're doing a fracture description, we uh, say it is either closed or open. So with an open fracture, this is where we have bone protruding from the skin. This is more serious uh, due to uh, tissue damage. It's going to require surgery. And this person is going to be high risk for infection because the bone has actually protruded through the skin with an open fracture. Sometimes you hear an open fracture referred to as a compound fracture. Now a closed fracture, okay, a closed fracture, sometimes this is referred to as a simple fracture. There is no bone protrusion through the skin. It can be realigned by external manipulation sometimes, but just remember open, you have bone protrusion through the skin. It is more serious. They're prone to infections. Closed fracture, there is no bone protrusion through the skin. Okay, so green stick fractures. Again, these may be out of order with your book, and make sure you refer to the pictures in your book as we are talking about these. With a green stick fracture, and you will have to know these fractures, so make sure that you are familiar with these types of fractures. So green stick fracture, uh, green stick is more common in children because their bones are more uh, flexible, they're softer, and the fracture line extends only partially through the bone with a green stick. And you have a picture that you can refer to uh, for the green stick. A complete fracture is a fracture that extends completely through the bone. Okay, uh, And even the uh, periosteum is interrupted on both sides. Remember, periosteum from anatomy and physiology is just the membrane that lines the outer surface of the bones. So again, a complete fracture, it is extending completely through the bone and it has disrupted the periosteum on both sides of that fracture. Comminuted fracture, a comminuted fracture is splintering of bone in three or more fragments. Okay? When we think about comminuted fractures and even when you look at the picture in your book, with comminuted you think about crush injuries. Okay, So someone who has been in an accident that involved crushing. So that is what we think about with comminuted. Impacted fracture, sometimes this is referred to as a telescoping fracture. This is where you have one or more fragments uh, that is forcibly wedged into another bone fragment. Okay, this can actually cause shortening of the extremity uh, in long bones with impacted fractures. Transverse fracture, this is where the break runs directly across the bone and we remember it is at a right angle. So transverse fractures, we have a fracture at a right angle. Oblique fractures, uh, it runs, the break is going to run diagonally across the bone. And what we remember about oblique, it is at a 45 degree angle. Very important. So oblique, we have the break running across the bone, it's at a 45 degree angle. Spiral fractures, uh, this is where the break coils around the bone. Okay, and it results from some sort of twisting, a twisting force. is what, uh, If a, an extremity has been twisted, we will see spiral fractures. Now, a Collie's fracture, um, 
Colley's fracture is a break in the distal portion of the radius. It's usually about uh, within an inch of the wrist joint. It's, uh, we see, tend to see Colley's fractures uh, whenever someone is falling and they try to break their fall by putting their hands down to catch themselves. And as, that is when we usually see a Colley's fracture. A Potts fracture is a break at the distal end of the fibula. Okay. And what happens when you have that break at the distal end of the fibula and it chips off a piece of the medial um, malleolus, okay, that bump uh, on the, when we think about that, it's the bump on the inside. Um, we have displacement of the foot. So with a POTS fracture, you'll actually see the foot project forward in a, in a very abnormal position because it has that break at the distal end of the fibula. So with POTS, just remember, you have displacement of the foot uh, outward. Google that, look up a picture of a POTS fracture. Um, it's um, quite grotesque. Uh, fractures are also described according to their location on a bone. So you may hear a fracture described as a proximal fracture, a mid-shaft fracture, or a distal fracture. Uh, bone, we know this from anatomy and physiology, bone is very vascular and bleeding is going to occur at that fracture site and out into the surrounding tissues. So you will see a lot of bruising in and around that fracture. So with uh, clinical manifestations, okay, when we're doing our assessment, uh, we're going to hear the patient complain of, of course, pain. There's going to be loss of normal function. We're going to see a deformity. We also uh, can see a change in the curvature or the length of the bone. Remember when we talked about hip fractures, we said that leg will be shorter and it's externally rotated. Uh, we talked about hearing crepitus. Okay, so crepitus, uh, that grating sound, okay, with bone rubbing against bone. So that's something that we may also uh, see during our assessment. So crepitus, soft tissue edema. So we're going to see edema. There may be warmth over the injured area. The ichymosis, the bruising of the skin and out into the surrounding tissues. The patient may complain of loss of sensation. Okay, if they complain of loss of sensation, okay, that indicates that we've got nerve constriction going on. Either the nerves are constricted or they have been, they possibly have been partially or totally severed. Patient may display signs of shock, okay, due to the tissue injury, blood loss, severe pain can put a patient into shock. Uh, during my assessment, we're going to do the rapid orthopedic and peripheral vascular assessment that we talked about earlier. Remember your seven P's. We've got to establish a baseline with our patient so that we can monitor changes in our patient. Remember in the surgical chapter, we talked about what was the importance of taking baseline vital signs. Well, so you have something to compare it to later on. So again, the P's, uh, one of the P's stands for pain. Okay, is this pain out of proportion with the injury? Okay, or has it increased with active or passive motion? So pain, paler, you know, that means pale. Paresthesia. Okay, that numbness, paralysis, polar temperature. Okay, is the extremity cold or colder as compared to the other extremity that isn't injured? So we're looking for that polar temperature. Does the affected extremity feel colder? Puffiness, that's our edema. Okay, so we're looking for edema, hematoma, things like that. Pulselessness, so no pulse. If we are unable to palpate um, distal pulses, uh, make sure you utilize a Doppler ultrasound device, and that can determine whether we have blood flow. Subjective data, uh, the patient's going to complain of pain, loss, they can uh, complain of loss of sensation. They might tell you the cause of their injury, how it happened. Objective data, warmth, edema, bruising, we can see a deformity, uh, loss of normal function in the extremity. We may see signs of shock. Uh, also signs of circulatory motor or sensory impairment. We may see those things. So diagnostic tests, uh, we're going to see x-rays done. Radiographic exam is the same thing as an x-ray. You may see a fluoroscopy done, and I have uh, placed 
a video on here so you will be able to see what exactly fluoroscopy is. Fluoros fluoroscopy, kind of think of it as a, like an, a real-time x-ray movie. That's, that's, what it, that's what it looks like. Uh, it shows um, extreme detail. And there is radiation exposure, but it's low, it's low amounts of radiation. So think of fluoroscopy as kind of like an x-ray movie in real time. And again, what, be sure and watch that video. Now, immediate management for fractures, splinting. Okay, we've got to do splinting to prevent edema. Uh, body alignment, we've got to make sure they, that we preserve their body alignment. Elevation of the body part to decrease edema. Application of cold packs, especially during the first 24 hours, to reduce bleeding, to reduce edema, and also to reduce pain. You would not want to apply warm packs during this time because this patient, again, like we said, bone is vascular. So there's going to already be bleeding. So when you use warmth to an area, that causes vasodilation and that causes even more bleeding. So we're going to use cold packs because cold uh, induces vasoconstriction. Again, this is Anatomy and Physiology 101. So we're going to be using cold packs to help to decrease bleeding, edema, and pain. Uh, we're going to administer analgesics as ordered. We're going to assess for changes in color, sensation, temperature, and most of all, cardinal. We're going to observe for signs of shock. Now some secondary management uh, for uh, closed fractures. They're going to replace bone fragments into their correct position. And how they do that, it is done through uh, one of four ways. So the first way they can do it is by closed reduction. And remember our definitions. Closed reduction means they're going to align uh, the bone and there is no surgery that is invo involved. So closed reduction with manual manipulation. Okay, they can do that with traction. Uh, number two, traction, of course, to straighten bones or relieve pressure. And um, they can also uh, relieve pressure like if there's a spinal fracture or a skeletal uh, fracture. So they can use it for either one, whether it's a, a femoral fracture or it's a spinal fracture, you can use traction. Now there are two different types of traction, which we will talk about more in depth in a little while. You have skin traction and you have skeletal traction. So with a skin traction, you do not have any pins penetrating through the skin and into the bone with the skin traction. They basically uh, uh, put these uh, cups that have adhesive on it onto the skin, and that is how they perform the traction. Now, skeletal traction, on the other hand, you're going to have uh, pins penetrating through the skin and into the bone with that type of traction. So you have skin traction and you have skeletal traction. Of course, with skeletal traction, you're going to have a whole lot higher risk for infection because we have those pins going into the bone. Uh, and ORIF is next. We know ORIF, O-R-I-F, stands for Open Reduction Internal Fixation. So we know open reduction. This person is having surgery for their fracture with open reduction. Remember, we talked about those terms. So open reduction, this person's going to have to have surgery. We said internal fixation just refers to the rods, the screws, and the plates that are used to keep the fracture stable. Okay, so we have proper healing. So with an ORIF, uh, an incision is made and the fractured bones are uh, held together. They're stabilized again with the screws, whatever, plates, rods, things like that. Number four is immobilization. Immobilization is going to be achieved um, through different ways. They can achieve immobilization by external fixation. External fixation would be like casting or splinting. Traction may be used for immobilization. And again, we said traction. There are two kinds. You have skin traction and skeletal traction. Or for immobilization, they might do internal fixation. So again, internal fixation, uh, they're going to achieve immobilization by using pins, plates, screws, wires, different things like that. All right, so medical management for an open fracture. <clears throat> Remember, open fracture means we have bone penetrating through the skin. All right, so with open fractures, surgical debridement. 
Surgical debridement is necessary to remove dirt, uh, foreign material, uh, tissue uh, that has necrosed or is devitalized. Also, it may be done uh, to remove necrotic bone. Uh, tetanus, okay, if their tetanus has uh, expired, we need to make sure that their tetanus uh, shot is given, with, especially with these open fractures. Tetanus is a bacteria, okay? It lives in soil, it lives in the intestines and feces of many animals. Uh, it can enter through a puncture wound. Some of the symptoms you may see of tetanus are jaw spasms, so they have spasms in the jaw. Sometimes you hear that as a locked jaw. Uh, stiff neck, difficulty swallowing. What tetanus uh, does, it's actually called a Clostridium tetani, it actually affects the nervous system, okay? It's attacking the nervous system and it's causing painful contractions to occur of the jaw, the neck. They can also have difficulty breathing. Okay, so first off, the one thing you know as a nurse is all compound fractures, any patient who comes in with a compound fracture needs to have a tetanus shot, okay? A tetanus toxoid. Uh, when you think about uh, tetanus, uh, we only medically manage tetanus. There is no cure for tetanus. So uh, we just manage complications until the effects of the tetanus toxin resolve on its own. Okay? Sometimes patients uh, can die from tetanus. Uh, they may have to be placed on a vent. So just keep that in mind. Tetanus is uh, very serious. So make sure anyone who comes in with an open fracture, they get that tetanus toxoid. Uh, they're going to do wound cultures, Prophylactic antibiotics may be ordered, of course, because of the compound fracture. Uh, observe for things like osteomyelitis. Remember we said osteomyelitis, that is a bone infection. So we're looking for osteomyelitis, tetanus. We're also looking for gangrene. With gangrene, you have necrosis that is occurring or the death of tissue. And that is due to a lack of blood supply. So we see necrosis of tissue. It can be necrosis of bone. Uh, some signs and symptoms that we see of gangrene are like purplish, uh, bluish, blackish skin. Uh, there is severe pain associated with gangrene, numbness, and a very foul-smelling discharge, so very malodorous discharge. Uh, wound closure, when there are no signs of infection that exist, they'll close the wound. They'll do reduction. Of course, we said uh, reduction can be open reduction or closed reduction because we've got to restore that fracture back to its correct alignment. And then also immobilization is going to be important. Some of your nursing interventions and your patient teaching encourage well-balanced diet, encourage fluids, exercising the unaffected joints, your muscle setting exercises, uh, skin care, elimination. Your patient teaching includes how to comfortably move in bed, how to transfer safely in and out of the bed, weight bearing restrictions need to be followed, um, proper use of assistive devices is important, avoidance of edema by properly uh, elevating the extremity, pain control, exercising uh, to maintain strength and enhance circulation, and then proper method of cleansing pins with surgical asepsis. So if my patient is in skeletal traction, we have to properly take care of those pins that are penetrating into the bone. Again, this patient's high risk for infection when you have skeletal traction. You do have a nursing care plan in your book. Okay, that is important and you need to make sure that you read it. It says nursing care plan, the patient with a fractured hip make sure that you read that nursing care plan. It has a lot of very good information in it for you to use. All right, so we're gonna be talking about fracture of the vertebrae. Okay, so uh, when we think about uh, vertebral fractures, uh, we think about how they happened. Uh, some of the uh, pathos of uh, vertebral fractures include uh, diving accidents, so someone has uh, dove into uh, shallow waters or they've hit something uh, with their head uh, when they have dove into like murky water, so they may struck their head on a submerged log or something like that. 
Um, any blow to the head or body can cause a vertebral fracture. Osteoporosis can be a cause. Metastatic cancer, motorcycle, car accidents. Uh, a displaced fracture uh, can place pressure on or actually sever the spinal cord nerves. And whenever you have severing of spinal cord nerves, this is going to cause permanent paralysis from the point of injury downward. So we've heard people say, you know, oh, they had um, an injury at L2 and they are paralyzed from their waist down. Okay, so displaced fractures can actually cause permanent paralysis in patients because it, it can actually sever the spinal cord nerves. All right, so clinical manifestations for vertebral fractures, uh, pain at the site of injury, partial or complete loss of mobility or sensation below the level of the injury, evidence of uh, the fracture on x-rays. During my assessment subjectively, I'm going to do a pain assessment. If injury to the spinal, if they had injury to the spinal cord and it has been severed, there will be no pain from the point of injury down. Okay, so at that point of injury, if there is still uh, nerve endings that are functioning, they can possibly feel injury at the point of impact, but below that, there will absolutely be none present. Uh, numbness, tingling, inability to move their extremity below the level of the trauma. Objective data, we're going to do a neuro assessment. Uh, remember back uh, in your first term, when you are doing a neuro assessment, some of the very important things that you assess with uh, during a neuro assessment. This is during your head to toe assessment. You're looking at pupillary reaction to light. Okay, so you're taking your pin light and you're shining it into the pupil and you should see the pupils constrict with that light source. That is called PERLA. Okay, that's what you're assessing for during your neuro assessment is PERLA. And that acronym is P-E-R-R-L-A. And again, I think we mentioned this in the surgical chapter. It stands for pupils equally round and reactive to light accommodation. So I take my pin light during my neuro assessment, I shine it into the pupils, and I should see constriction of the pupil. So that is part of PERLA, and that's part of my neuro assessment. Uh, I'm also, during my neuro assessment, I'm going to assess hand grip and strength. Uh, I'm going to assess to see whether they can move their extremities. What is my patient's orientation? Okay, Are they oriented to person, place, time, and current circumstances? Okay, I'm going to do vital signs. I'm going to see what their reaction to painful stimuli is. I'm going to observe for fecal or urinary retention, uh, signs of hemorrhaging. Okay, my signs of hemorrhaging, again, decreases in blood pressure, increased pulse, increased respirations, decreased urinary output. My patient might be acting apprehensive, uh, restless. Remember, apprehension and restlessness can be my first telltale signs that my patient is hemorrhaging and going into shock. So that's important for me to remember and assess for. Diagnostic tests, x-rays, they may do spinal taps to assess the spinal fluid, which spinal fluid normally should be clear. So CSF, uh, when we're talking about spinal fluid in that subarachnoid space, it is normally clear. It should be clear. If there is the presence of blood, if it is pink tinged, okay, that indicates trauma. So that is the reason why they're doing the spinal tap. So it should be clear with CSF if it is, if we see the presence of blood, that's indicating trauma. Okay, so medical management, medical management. When you have a patient with stable injuries that are not threatening to the spinal cord's integrity, uh, your patient is going to be treated with pain medications, muscle relaxants, uh, Prophylactic anticoagulants, okay, because we're going to try to avoid uh, thromboembolic complications. So we're trying to prevent blood clots from occurring. Uh, back support um, by bracing, casting to help maintain an erect posture. Uh, ambulation with assistance, just follow your orders. Now, unstable fractures are the most serious because they involve displacement of bone. So what we see with unstable fractures is the patient is going to be, have uh, traction 
open reduction where they had to do an incision uh, and do a, a surgical procedure. Maybe they placed what is called a Harrington rod. Okay, they might have placed uh, one of those to stabilize the vertebrae. And I put a picture, the picture is after this slide, of a Harrington rod. So make sure you take a look at that. And that is what uh, stabilizes the vertebrae. So that might be done during open reduction. Cranial skeletal traction, if they have a cervical spine fracture, you have a picture of a cranial skeletal traction in your book. Uh, they refer that to sometimes as a halo, okay? So in your book, you have a picture of um, cervical traction and then a gentleman who has um, a halo device on to stabilize a cervical fracture. That is called a halo brace. Uh, the good thing about a halo brace is, is that it allows for mobility. But the thing about it is it actually screws into the skull. So uh, your patient may also uh, have, have pelvic traction if they have sustained a lumbar fracture. Nursing interventions and patient teaching. Uh, maintenance of fracture fixation. So we've got to maintain the fracture fixation device and the patient while they are in the uh, fixation. And how are we going to do that? Well, we already talked about this, the importance of log rolling our patient when uh, we're uh, performing position changes for whatever reason. So again, remember we should have two other people helping us. One person should be at the top, the head of the patient. The other person assisting should be uh, midway around the buttocks region. And then the third person who is helping should be down near the feet. And then everybody at once rolls the patient. So that is log rolling. Uh, make sure you follow correct procedure for turning your patient in uh, any specialty bed they may be in. Elevate the head of the bed no more than 30 degrees. Use stabilization devices okay, for, head, uh, for the head and back. And then always assess your traction. And toward the end of the chapter, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, you have different uh, types of traction that can be used. You have Buck's traction, you have uh, Russell's traction. There's a whole array of different types of traction, you know, skeletal traction, which we talked about. But there is different pictures of traction located in your book. And I'm not going to say the page number because in the event uh, when this book edition changes, it will not be the same page. But just know there are pictures in the back of, uh, toward the end of the chapter that uh, show you the different types of traction. And again, you have Russell's traction, uh, Buck's traction, okay, balance suspension traction, and we'll talk about those here in a, a little bit later. Now you have some very, very, very important information that you need to know about if your patient is in traction. This is stuff that is on NCLEX, uh, this has been on my tests, my quizzes, whatever. You better make sure you know it. It can be on your comprehensive predictor in the third term. So what am I going to do when I'm assessing my patient who is in traction? I'm looking at the apparatus device of the traction and I have to make sure that the following is intact. So here's what I am doing. Very important. I am making sure that the weights are hanging freely. So the weights hanging at the end of the bed should be hanging freely. They should, the ropes should not be twisted, okay? The, they should be hanging freely. Ropes do, should not be twisted. If they are twisted, that can counteract the traction, okay? So making sure the weights are hanging freely and the ropes are not twisted. That's very important. Uh, also assess your patient's skin integrity. Okay, I'm assessing, I'm doing my skin assessment. I'm looking for things like erythema, edema, tenderness, and things like that. So when I'm assessing traction, I'm looking at the weights hanging at the end of the bed. I'm making sure those weights are hanging freely and that the ropes are not twisted. Uh, the patient teaching includes um, back support, and how we achieve that is by using a firm mattress, sitting in a straight, firm chair, no longer than um, up to 20 to 30 minutes, using proper lifting techniques with the use of the leg muscles and not the back. Uh, also back exercises to help strengthen those muscles are important as well. So make sure that you read over your patient problems. 
Okay, you have two there, potential for infection, and then you have compromised physical mobility. So make sure that you read those. They're very important. All right, next thing we're going to talk about is uh, pelvic fractures. Okay, so fracture of the pelvis. <clears throat> Most pelvic fractures are due to trauma, uh, such as a fall, maybe they were in a car accident, uh, crushing accidents can cause pelvic fractures. Now, the thing with pelvic fractures is that we have to keep in mind there, that there are vital abdominal organs in and around that area in the, in the pelvic region that can be injured. That includes the bladder. The bladder can be injured with a pelvic fracture, the vagina, the uterus, the liver, the spleen, the intestines, uh, and the kidneys can actually be injured uh, during a um, pelvic fracture. So keep that in mind. Uh, the pelvis has, uh, again from A and P, uh, the pelvis has a very rich blood supply. So there can be extensive blood loss that is possible with a pelvic fracture. Clinical manifestations, very important, very, very important with pelvic fractures. Okay, so clinical manifestations. They're unable to bear weight without discomfort. Uh, local tenderness and edema. Hematuria can occur. Okay, hematuria, we know that means blood in the urine. So with hematuria, that is telling me that this patient has sustained bladder trauma. Okay, hemorrhaging, very important. Hemorrhage is the most life-threatening complication associated with a pelvic fracture. And again, that's due to the pelvis's rich blood supply. So hemorrhaging, that is your most life-threatening complication associated with a pelvic fracture. During my assessment subjectively, my patient's going to complain of pelvic pain, tenderness, maybe their back is hurting, uh, restlessness, anxiety. They might progressively become disoriented, and that's telling me this patient is going into shock. This may be, these may be the cardinal signs of my patient going into shock. Objective data, assess for muscle spasms in the pelvic region, uh, bruising over the pelvis, the perineum, the groin the suprapubic area. Uh, they have the inability to raise their legs in a supine position. We see external foot rotation okay, to the affected side and also shortening of the leg. Okay, Remember, we saw those things uh, with a hip fracture. So we see it also with a pelvic fracture. So we see the external uh, rotation of the foot and then we see the shortening of the leg that occurs. Vital signs may indicate this patient is in shock. So I see hypotension, tachycardia, uh, increased respirations. Uh, I see um, oliguria, which means uh, now they're not having, you know, urine, I'm not seeing a lot of uh, urinary output. So that's telling me the kidneys, you know, uh, are involved or the fact that my patient is going into shock and they are losing blood internally and therefore the kidneys are not being properly perfused with blood. So I see oliguria. Uh, also, I see diaphoresis that can occur. Monitor this patient for fat embolism syndrome, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit. Uh, fat embolism syndrome is just where fat uh, uh, is released from the bone marrow, and it enters into the bloodstream. And the danger with that is, is that it forms emboli. So you have all these uh, little emboli that is traveling through the blood vessels. Okay, that goes to the lungs. My patient is going to be in deep trouble. Okay, so we'll talk more about fat embolism later. So again, uh, fat embolism is just where fat is released from the bone marrow out into the bloodstream. And then you have all these little micro emboli traveling through the blood vessels. And these can get lodged in the lungs. Can uh, cause my patient to go into uh, acute respiratory distress. Uh, make sure you assess your bowel sounds in all four quads. Um, bowel and rectal lacerations are possible with pelvic fractures. Assess the color and amount of urine output uh, due to possible bladder lacerations also. Diagnostic tests, they're going to do abdominal x-rays, CTs. They may do an intravenous pylogram to determine if there is kidney damage. And this is just where they inject a dye to see how well the kidneys are removing that dye. So that lets us know if we have kidney damage or not. They're gonna draw labs, uh, hematocrit, hemoglobin. They're gonna do uh, 
UAs. They're going to check the stool for occult blood to determine if we have hemorrhaging that's occurring. Um, medical management. Medical management is going to depend on the fracture site. Okay, so some of the things that we think about, bed rest, okay, and again, you do not have to remember bed rest times three weeks and all that stuff. You do not have to remember um, all of that. Okay, uh, so bed rest, uh, skeletal traction, okay, uh, pelvic slings. Uh, I have placed, um, I can't remember if it's a, a video or a slide, but you have a, a pelvic sling. I believe it's the SAM pelvic sling uh, video that I placed on here, so make sure that you take a look at that, or if I put it on the slide, I can't remember right now, but just take a look at that and see uh, what exactly that uh, pelvic sling entails. So one of those can be used, especially if my patient has a bilateral pelvic fracture. Um, for severe fractures, the patient may have to be placed into what's called a spica or a body cast that may be used for um, support. You do have a picture of a spica cast in your book. Okay, so turn around, uh, flip through the pages until you see it. It's uh, in a figure and it says spica cast and it has um, figure A and B, and it shows a rod, you know, um, with the casting from the um, arm down to the torso, and then it also shows a picture of a rod that's in between the lower extremities. So that is what is considered to be a spica or a body cast. So take a look at that picture. Uh, nursing interventions, patient teaching, priority, monitoring for signs and symptoms of shock. Measuring my patient's abdominal girth every eight hours for signs of increased abdominal pressure uh, due to the possibility of internal hemorrhaging. So that's important to measure that abdominal girth. And remember in the surgical chapter, we talked about how to measure that abdominal girth. Okay, You make a mark and everyone measures from that point. Okay, Monitor your INO. Uh, Foley catheter, uh, if they have Foley catheter, you're monitoring your output, of course, and the color, documenting on that. Implementing nursing interventions related to uh, impaired mobility, impaired skin integrity, uh, problems with uh, fluid volume, and pain management. Reinforce reasons uh, for immobility. Explain to your patient why they are having to be immobile and then why they can't bear full weight. That's important. If you explain to them and educate them as to why, they're more apt to follow uh, the physician's orders. Explain pain measures. Again, if your patient is on PRN pain medications, make sure you explain to them what that means and the fact that they need to ask for it. Uh, explain turning and moving techniques, again, to prevent skin impairment. Make sure you read your patient problem. Okay. Make sure you read that. There's only one. It's compromised tissue perfusion related to hemorrhage, hypovolemia, and shock. So make sure you read that along with your nursing interventions. This is a picture of the Harrington rod. The Harrington rod, if you'll remember when we were talking about vertebral fractures, these are used uh, with unstable vertebral fractures. And remember, unstable fractures are the most serious. So and then when we think about um, a Harrington rod, they make an incision and then they place these rods down both sides of the vertebrae. And this is going to provide stabilization of the vertebrae. So this is what uh, Harrington rods look like. 